So, if ever you're tempted to be uh, an evil genius and construct a lair for yourself, probably the best advice I think that uh, you could be given would be do not put a self-destruct uh, mechanism in your evil lair. I mean, you know, trust me on this, you'll regret it. The second piece of advice for baddies is don't go around telling everybody your plans. Now, the reason I'm holding a Dalek here is because Bob Blakely wanted to have more Daleks in the uh, presentations. And, you know, since we're talking about confidentiality and encryption, revealing their secret plans to everybody is basically the main reason why the Daleks uh, seem to always come off badly. Uh, none of their plans uh, work and the main reason is they're always telling. How do you uh, get away with your evil plan without uh, people knowing? Well, you need to use encryption. And that's what uh, the reason the uh, Nazis were using uh, this, the uh, Enigma machine, so that people wouldn't know what they were doing as they invaded Poland and France. Okay, so what is encryption and how does it work? Well, there's various ways you can do encryption. And in this particular module, we're going to be looking at stream ciphers. Um, they're one of the two basic types of encryption cipher. Um, one's called stream cipher, the other's a block cipher. We'll come to the black block ciphers in the next module. And what we're seeing in this uh, episode uh, is uh, an unbreakable cipher and how it was broken. And that had some serious consequences uh, for two people who went to the electric chair as a result. So we're going to be focusing on stream ciphers um, in this module. And we're actually going to be, you know, this is the point at which we're going to start to need a small piece of math. But fortunately, it's uh, a piece of math that uh, most people probably heard about in middle school or possibly even elementary school. Uh, what, we, what we need is what's called clock arithmetic or in mathematics we call it modular arithmetic. OK, so uh, basically what it means is that when we add or divide two numbers, we're going to the result is going to be the remainder dividing by some other number. So if we are looking at a plus B mod 10, the result is just going to be the last digit when we write it down in decimal. So uh, 15 mod 10 is 5, 37 mod 10 is 7. And if we want to calculate 7 plus 8, uh, well, 7 plus 8 plus is 15. 7 plus 8 mod 10 is simply 5. And this circular notion uh, is very useful uh, feature. We also use it in other ciphers, uh, which we'll get to later when we're doing elliptic curve cryptography. Okay, so... Uh, in when we're doing crypto, uh, we're particularly interested in uh, arithmetic mod 2, which is operating on the bit level when we call it an XOR function, and also arithmetic mod 25 when we're working on bytes at a time. Uh, in this presentation, I'm also going to use um, arithmetic mod base 26, and that's because there are 26 characters in the alphabet and that allows me to show you uh, how this these systems are working without needing to convert the num letters to numbers and back again. I can just do everything in letters. OK, so that unbreakable cipher is a system called a one time pad. And the first time we see them uh, written uh, a description of them written down is 1882 when Frank Miller uh, mentions them. Uh, but they've been reinvented many times since and uh, they quite likely were used even before that. And they're actually one of the very simplest ciphers. Uh, and the security comes from the fact that the key is at least as long as the plain text. And that's what gives the one-time pad 
its security. So the principle of operation is this. To encrypt, we take a ciphertext that's some number of bytes, L bytes long, and we take a key, which I'm going to call the cipher stream, that is also at least as long. Okay. And what we do is that we combine each letter of the ciphertext with each letter of the key using any reversible combination function. And the ciphertext is the result. And to decrypt, we just do the same thing in reverse. And the combinator function, well, it can be anything that uh, allows us to reverse it um, when we apply it again. Uh, so it, we can use modular arithmetic, base, 20, uh, base 256 if we're operating on bytes, or base 26 if we're operating on letters. Uh, when we're doing this uh, on computers, we typically use an XOR function, which is modular arithmetic at the bit level. Um, and it, it, it's a pretty simple thing to do. So why is this unbreakable? Well, let's see what happens when we apply it and we try and do it by break, try to break it as brute force. And here we're going to be using letters instead of bytes. And we're going to add the letters together using clock arithmetic. And so we start with the plain text. And we're going to start with the plain text here. We're going to start the traitor is Alice. And one of the things you might notice on the Enigma machine here is there is no space bar. Space is, you know, we normally just disregard spaces when we're uh, doing uh, encryption at this level. Um, yeah, it's just in those days they uh, didn't see the need to encode the space. These days when we're doing operating at the byte level and characters, you know, we do uh, bother to encrypt spaces, but yeah, we just smash all the letters together. So our plain text is the traitor is Alice. And so we're going to encrypt that with a random key to get the ciphertext. And now Mallet is going to get hold of the ciphertext and look at it. Okay, so he's trying to try and decrypt this by brute force. So this is, you know, if, if brute force doesn't work, well, nothing will. So he looks at the first letter and he asks himself, well, could it be A? Well, yes, it could be if the key was T. Could it be B? Yes, it could be if the key was U. Could it be C? Well, yes, it could be if the key was V, and so on. The first letter could be absolutely anything, and there's no way that Mallet can know whether his guess is correct or not. There's no structure, there is no pattern in the ciphertext that allows Mallet to differentiate an incorrect guess from a correct one. And so we cannot use a brute force attack against this cipher. And this uh, fact was uh, first put down in math by Claude Shannon uh, during the uh, Second World War. And, you know, uh, knowing that you've got an unbreakable cipher is pretty useful. Only one-time pads turn out to be breakable in practice. You know, how's that possible? Well, to see that, we've got to go back a bit and look at um, Caesar ciphers to understand why one-time pads can be broken if you use them wrong. Okay, so the Caesar cipher was mentioned by Suetonius, who said, if he had something confidential to say, he wrote it in cipher, that is, by changing the order of the letters of the alphabet that not a word could be made out. If anyone wishes to decipher these and get at their meaning, he must substitute the fourth letter of the alphabet, namely D for A, and so on with the others. So this is what's known as a Caesar cipher after Julius Caesar, whose army used this code. Okay, now this was, so it's using modulo arithmetic uh, under the cover. So the character is replaced by the character plus three mod 26. The key is three. And, you know, this was probably sufficient when their opponents were mostly illiterate barbarians. Um, you know, 
the biggest risk they probably faced here was that a slave might be with the uh, group that they were attacking and might know how to read and write, in which case the cipher was probably sufficient to stop them from uh, reading these texts. They'd probably just assume it was a different language they didn't know. Now, this system didn't work so well for Augustus, of course, because Augustus was uh, fighting other Romans. And so they all knew the Caesar cipher, you know, because they'd all been in the army at the time. And so uh, Augustus changed the key. And so Suetonius mentions this. Whenever he wrote in cipher, he wrote B for A, C for B, and the rest of the letters uh, on the same principle using AA for Z. Uh, this is strange, you know, why did he have to double up the letter? I mean, like, if you were writing this out, uh, surely you'd pretty quickly realise that you never had an A all on its own. And you, yeah, so I, I suspect that this was something that Suetonius heard from another source, but didn't actually try out himself because if you try it out yourself, you pretty quickly realise that you're not going to double up that letter. So Caesar cipher, if it's a true Caesar cipher, it's just a shift. Well, breaking it's pretty simple. There are only 26 possibilities. So, you know, you can just do trial and error. Brute force will give you the result in 26 tries. And, you know, one of them, you're not shif you're shifting it by zero letters. So the cipher text and the plain text are the same thing. So they're a really trivial code to break, but this doesn't stop a mafia boss called Bernardo Provenzano uh, from trying to use a Caesar cipher to hide his activities from the authorities. So in his cipher, A became four, B became five, and so on. So, you know, 2,000 years after Julius Caesar, Italians still using Caesar's cipher. I'm sure that Caesar would be proud. So Caesar ciphers are junk, but uh, we can make them a bit more secure if we say, okay, instead of just shifting the alphabet, let's mix the target up completely so that any letter can go to potentially any of the other letters um, and we won't keep the same order. So now A can become D, B can become X, C can become M, and so on. And when we do this, the number of potential output permutations is factorial 26. That's huge. That's more than 2 to the power 88. So this is an 88-bit key. You know, our work factor is tremendous. Well, no, it's not. You see, although we've got an incredibly an large an impressive and should be secure key space our work factor is miserably small and the reason for this is that certain letters are much more common than others the letter e is the most common of all of course and the letter z is one of the least common and so if you have this knowledge you can look at the ciphertext of a substitution cipher and you can work out the messages with as few as 50 uh, characters of cipher text. Um, that's usually enough to break the code. And there are variations of this uh, approach. Uh, so one of the common variations is, okay, so E is a commonly occurring letter. So instead of just having one character output for E, we'll have 20, and this will balance out our frequency table. Uh, sometimes they use a book as the key, and so you might have uh, volume 13, um, line se page th 342, line 7 of the Oxford English Dictionary. You know, the sort of thing. And then, if so long as the people on both sides have the same book, they can work out the key. And there, you know, the security is not really coming from, the security is coming from the fact that we're using an incredibly large key. But again, you know, the key has some structure to it. And, you know, one of the problems with using dictionaries is that um, the dictionaries themselves 
have uh, a lot of, you know, they're in alphabetical order for a start. So they have structure. And so yeah, you can make the substitution cipher a bit more secure by adding a few curl cues and elaborations to it. But if, you know, if the, the attacker knows what they're doing, the patterns are still there and the attacker can actually get around them. It's not a very secure cipher, even if you go through these balancing and so on effects. Uh, now, this sort of cipher, it's been used throughout history. Uh, every culture that has um, written language pretty much has you know, come to some sort of code. Um, it's mentioned in the Kama Sutra. That mentions uh, Mnakchita Vikalpa as art number 44 of the 64 arts that is talking in secret uh, tongues and one of the interesting things here is that the Kama Sutra itself was used for centuries as a type of cipher and you know as, as with most countries most cultures uh, Indian literature has from time to time been uh, subject to censorship and you know, authors knew if they wrote about sex, uh, then they wouldn't get approval to publish their books and so on. And so what uh, some very crafty authors did was that they started using the Kama Sutra as a code. And the thing here was that this was the one book that everybody who was anyone in that society had read it. You know, some of them wouldn't admit it, but they'd read it. And in particular, they'd all read that one particular part of the book. And so when that particular part of the book is describing the various positions, you will note that each position there is an accompanying bizarre, irrelevant details like, you know, uh, the uh, partners having bells attached to their ankles that jingle and so on. And what this does is it provides a form of code so that then if you're an author, who's writing a book and you want to have a racy passage, well, you're not allowed to mention the sex, but you can mention the jingling bells. And then anybody who is anybody who has read the book knows immediately, ah, now I know what they're talking about, and the uh, meaning is conveyed and the censor doesn't get upset. And so the Kama Sutra was used itself as a code. So you can another thing that you can do with book ciphers is to use the text of a book as a key. And uh, this is often done with the Declaration of Independence, which is you know, a text that is you know, virtually everybody in the United States would have a copy somewhere in the house. And so what that you do there is that you use that as the key, the cipher stream, in the same way that you would use uh, the key in a one-time pad. And so what you do is you, again, you combine the letters, modulo 26, uh, letter by letter, to uh, get the output. Okay, so this is an example of what we call a stream cipher. And this particular stream cipher is woefully insecure. And the reason, and not just because everybody and their uncle has a copy of the Declaration of Independence, you can break it even if, the attacker doesn't know what the key is. And the reason for this is patterns. Just as the, the patterns allow the simple substitution cipher to be broken, well, when you use a stream cipher with text as the key, the patterns are still going to leak through. And we can detect them. Uh, it's very, very easy to do this with a computer, but you can even detect them if you're sufficiently determined doing it by pencil and paper. I mean, the most frequent uh, combination of letters is going to be EE. -E. The least frequent combination is going to be any combination of J, X and Z. And you can also do what's called digraph analysis and trigraph analysis, which is basically saying, well, one letter often follows another and there's frequencies there that can be used as purchase. And we can also use word dictionaries to test our combinations. Uh, now, this is obviously something that if you're doing it at hand, uh, decrypting a single uh, ciphertext is going to take you a lot of effort. You know, maybe a day, maybe even a week 
but it is possible to do it. Uh, if you've got a computer, it's trivial. The work factor is almost nothing. And so this gets us on to the Venona Project, which was started in 1943 uh, by a woman called Jean Grable. And uh, the reason the project started was that even though at the time the United States and the Soviet Union were allies in World War II, the United States were worried that Stalin might make a separate peace with the Nazis. And this, you know, he'd already made a pact with the Nazis at the start of the war. You know, that's how World War II started. Uh, Stalin and Hitler made the, made the uh, pact and divided up Poland. Actually, it started a bit before when Chamberlain and uh, Hitler made a pact uh, but, and gave Czechoslovakia to Hitler. But you know, Stalin was not a reliable person. And so the United States wanted to know what the NKVD, which is what the uh, KGB was calling itself those, in those days, they wanted to know what they were doing. And the Soviets were encrypting their diplomatic communications using a one-time pad. But the thing is that they were sloppy. And, you know, th producing cipher stream is difficult. You know, if you're going to produce really good cipher stream, you've got to do it using um, a truly random process, you know, throwing dice again and again and again. That takes time. It takes effort. It's time consuming. And so uh, what uh, the Russians decided was, oh, I think that we could, um, I think that we could speed this up again, double our output if we reuse the one pad time pad. So instead of using them once, we're going to use them twice. Now, a one time pad is perfectly secure. A two time pad is completely insecure. And here's why. Well, let's look at what happens when you reuse a one time pad to make it a two time pad. So we'll start off with two uh, ciphertexts A and B that are both generated using the same cipher stream. So ciphertext A is going to be P1 plus the key, the cipher stream. And ciphertext B is going to be P2 plus the cipher stream. Well, what happens if we subtract one of those from the other? Well, the result will be P1 plus the cipher stream minus P2 minus the cipher stream, which will be P1 minus P2, which means that, again, we've got that stream cipher using text as the key. And we can break it in the exact same way. The patterns in P1 are not completely masked by the patterns in P2. And we can recover both the plain text. And this had real consequences. This led to the Venona decrypts that in, identified many Soviet agents, including the uh, atomic bomb spies Klaus Fuchs, uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. And the Rosenbergs, of course, went to the electric chair as a result. And this was also how the Cambridge spy ring uh, in, um, in the UK was uh, exposed. Uh, Don McLean and Guy Burgess were implicated by the Nanunma decrypts. And Kim Philby, who was another member of the ring, uh, had access to the Nanunma uh, material and tipped them off. And that's how they all managed to escape. So a one time pad, the advantage here that it offers perfect security, sorry, perfect security when used perfectly. The disadvantage is they're very brittle. They're only perfect when they're used perfectly. And if you use them wrong, they become very weak. The other problem with them is you require a key stream that is at least the same length as the plain text. And so you can only have a secure conversation if you've already previously had a secure conversation. And that makes them very impractical. You know, we certainly can't use them as a basis for internet security. But they were and still are used as a basis for diplomatic security. And 
later on when we get to public key cryptography there's an another interesting anecdote to do with what was called the most perfect floating gin palace of all time so you, we've got that to uh, look forward to if you like floating gin palaces okay so we've got a theoretically perfect unbreakable cipher what could possibly go wrong well, i think you can guess what will go wrong uh basically one time pads uh whenever somebody's talking about it it is almost invariably that when they're pr promoting a scheme that's going to turn out to be crypto snake oil uh there's various um versions of this but you know mentioning one time pads is a typical snake oil smell another is anybody who is proposing something with a ridiculously large key you know million bit keys thousand bit keys almost invariably snake oil so um and the problem is that what happens is that people read up in some popular uh accounting of cryptography one time pads are perfectly secure but they're reading it from the secondary literature uh where they don't explain why they're perfectly secure and so they don't realize well the, it's because the key size is infinite effectively and so what they do is say oh well if you can't the problem is that the key is just too big so i'll i'll work out a way of shortening compressing the key and then they come up with the idea of generating the key from a run, random number generator which is not actually a bad idea in itself it's just that you've got to really understand how random your random number generator and have a really good random number generator and that's what a stream cipher is the problem is that most of the people who do this sort of thing don't understand how to make random number generators either and so what they think they're getting is all the advantages of a one time pad without the disadvantages what they're getting is all the disadvantages without the advantage and even if you design them correctly stream ciphers are brittle when they're incorrectly used same just as with a, a one time pad uh and they're not perfect they can be broken with cryptanalysis if you generate your cipher stream from a seed that has 128 bits then your work factor will be no greater than 2 to the power 128 these are called stream ciphers and they're one of the most commonly used techniques for encrypting large quantities of information and the reason people use stream ciphers is that they are very very fast uh so are they secure well they are sort of the thing is that you got to be absolutely sure that the key stream is never reused or else you've got the same problem you have is with uh, one time pads becoming two time pads and you've also got to be sure that your random number generator is sufficiently random and doesn't leak some information uh so they're secure but they're not infinitely secure so how do we build one well there's two basic ways one is to use a random number generator to generate the key stream and this can be very fast uh one of the best known examples is a scheme called R RC4 uh which stands for reverse code 4 sorry Re reverse cipher 4 and Re Ron reverse being the R in RSA and a weakness was found in this scheme by Flora Martin and Shamir in 2001 uh, Shamir being the S in RSA and basically what they found was that if you start up the cipher stream with two keys that are closely related then this leaks some information that can allow you to extract the plain text and even get hold of the key so it's not a very secure um, uh, cipher uh, unless you apply it in a particular way um, the Wi-Fi security scheme wireless enhanced privacy WEP used it used rc4 in a inadvisable mode uh which is one of the reasons why there are applications out there that you can download that will decrypt traffic that's been encrypted using web wi-fi security and that's why wi-fi moved to wpa and wpa2 so rc4 it 
is still widely used, but a better choice these days is a cipher called ChaCha, which is the one that the stream cipher this is recommended if you're going to use a stream cipher with TLS. TLS originally used R RC4. Uh, it used it with a construction that was actually nicely robust uh, and isn't vulnerable to the uh, Shamir attack. But um, at this point, if you're designing something new, forget RC4, just go straight to ChaCha or uh, use a block cipher. Uh, my friend John Callis has an aphorism, uh, don't use a stream cipher to do the job of a block cipher. What is a block cipher? Well, that's going to be the topic of the next module. Uh, where we're going to be looking at block ciphers, we're going to be looking at digital encryption standard DES and the advanced encryption standard AES. And so those are the go-to ciphers if you want a high grade of security today. And we're going to be examining those in detail. And so please stick around for that. Uh, please hit like, hit, please hit subscribe and please tell or your friends about this course if they're working in the computer world. I mean, you know, we're all locked down here for we don't know how many weeks. We might as well learn something. And if you want to learn about computer security, learning about cryptography is a pretty good start. It's not all there is to in security, but it's a pretty good start. So please click like, please subscribe, please share the work. Thank you very much.